Hey, feels like I've been gone since last year. Um, yeah, I was just in Israel, and um, I got back late Thursday night, so I have a bit of jet lag. Although it's not too bad right this moment because it's about five in the afternoon in my, so I'm a little hungry. <laughs> but beyond that, um, yeah. Anyways, it's it's so good to be back with all of you with this community, and what a what a morning we've had already. Um, I learned a lot during the children's message <laughs> about Tara. Um, yeah, and the meditation was so beautiful, and uh, IMC three was so beautiful in Ralston. It's good to see you again. Thanks for playing such good songs, writing such good songs, and also giving me a message from my mom. So, um, yeah, so I, I've been, a question that's been just sort of uh, rolling around in my head, we talked about this morning at the pre-talk gathering, which you all should come to sometime. It's a very life-giving, sort of rich little community we have that meets before this. And what did we talk? We talked about this morning a simple question: What makes a place sacred? What makes a place sacred? And of course, you want you know what is what is it? What do you, what does the word sacred even mean? And I don't know if I'm going to necessarily answer that. I think it's a good question for you to think about. What makes a place sacred? What is sacred, after all? Here are some themes that came up. Time was one of them. Time makes a place sacred. These are things that we discussed in the, in the pre-talk. Um, a sense of shared transcendence. That was a word that came up more than once. Um, a place of connection. This was a theme. What makes a place sacred? I don't know. Something about a sense of connection. A story can make a place sacred. After all, this community has a story, and that's part of what makes, if you want to call this, a sacred space, which it feels that way to me. Part of that is just the story and, and the ways in which our individual story is interwoven with some sort of larger story. That can make a place sacred. Uh, presence. Uh, here's a good one. Um, a place filled to its fullest with meaning. Russell gave us that, that uh, particular suggestion. A place filled to its fullest with meaning. Um, here's another one that... that Somehow in the place of the sacred, we feel the past, like something, like as if we're standing on something that transcends our own um, small life. But also standing on that long history, one feels a sense of, um, of bigness. It's kind of a paradox. You feel small and big at the same time. That's maybe something with with sacred. It's a, I, I think it's an interesting question coming off a place like um, Israel, or Jerusalem for that matter. Is it sacred? Is it not? I mean, it's also a crazy place. You should all come with me sometime. Um, there's history and nuance and architecture and old stones and um, shopkeepers and banks and ATMs and electricity. It's a weird, it's a weird place, um, and a and a life giving place, and and more than that, <laughs> it's a strange um, place on the globe. So I'm asking the question: What makes a place sacred? Because I think it's an important question, and I see. I think I'm also asking: What is the sacredness of a place trying to teach? I mean, in, in other words. If, if, if a place is sacred, all right, so what? <laughs> what, is, what is its sacredness trying to communicate or teach or invite one into? Or is it just the place? Is it just a sacred place? And we're all supposed to say, wow, how special that place is. So the, anyway, these are things that, have, that I've been um, mulling over. And I've been thinking a lot about the Bible because I was just in, in Israel for a few, a few weeks. And you can't avoid it. It's everywhere. It's on the signs, you know turn right, go to Beersheba. You know, this is a place mentioned in the Bible. So it's, it's a strange uh, landscape um, filled with story and filled with ancient stories and ancient stories upon ancient stories upon ancient stories and faiths built upon other faiths, <laughs> people groups built upon other people groups 
and a kind of hodgepodge. Um, and I want to say in a very simple way, what is the Bible? Well, it's a collection of stories about sacred places. All of the stories are rooted somewhere. They're not abstract. They're not lessons. You know, I think there's something about um, maybe post enlightenment or maybe medieval Christianity. We can always blame medieval Christianity. We don't even know what that is. We're like, but it sounds bad. Um, but where everything became conceptual, so much of theology was conceptual. And, and in some ways, there's a kind of an evolution of thought there. Um, but it definitely was, was disconnected from place. And faith became ideas, largely. Ideas and beliefs about ideas. You better have the right beliefs about ideas to be in the, in the group. But that's not really the story of the Bible. It's a story of place. Like I, I, like I gave you that strange, what a weird verse from the Bible uh, we all just took in, in, our, uh, in our reading. And Abraham planted a tamarisk tree in Beersheba. Okay. What's, uh, there is an idea there. There is a symbol. There is a metaphor. But it's not a metaphor also. It's a place. He didn't plant a tree in Jenison, you know. Planted it, I mean... <laughs> as far as I know, planted a tree in Beersheba and then called upon the name of the eternal God. It's kind of a strange phrase. Even in Hebrew, it's a bit strange. Um, and, and I've been thinking about this because, because we're talking about Terah, because we're talking about the earth as a place, as a, here we are as terrestrial beings on the earth. And the Bible, in many res respects, at least in the collective Western psyche, has helped us or hurt our, the way that we're oriented toward the earth itself. Probably helped and hurt. Like even if you think about the opening lines of Genesis, famous ones like uh, subdue the earth. What does that mean? I mean, you would right away want to, and you can see how that has a po positive and a negative connotation depending on really how you interpret such a word. That's not the word in Hebrew, by the way. It doesn't say subdue, but we'll get it. Another talk for another time. But I'm saying it sets up a certain orientation toward the earth itself. And that's kind of why I want to, want to hover around this question. What makes a place sacred? And what, how are we then related to the earth itself or to particular places on the earth? Or have we now had enough of all this sacred crap? which sometimes after Jerusalem is the way you feel. You're like, enough, enough. Let's just go to the mall, buy coffee, go to the bar. Enough of the Western Wall and the Dome of the Rock. I mean, seriously. But it doesn't seem, and actually in some respects, um, when I first moved to Israel, I used to live there. When I first moved there, everything shut down on Shabbat, on the Sabbath. And um, unless you were in East Jerusalem, then it, then it didn't really shut down. But um, it was actually hard to find a restaurant to go to. And things have changed quite significantly. And on the one hand, it seems like it's becoming more secular, if you want to use that particular word. It's now a lot easier to go find a place to eat on the Sabbath. On the other hand, uh, it doesn't feel that way. It seems like religious fervor is growing. And I think that's also... Uh, possibly true in a more global sense. It's a strange paradox. Sometimes the world feels more, uh, I don't know if, uh, um, sort of like secular humanist, maybe. And on the other hand, it feels like religion is on the rise. Now, which is it? <laughs> it depends on where you are, I suppose. It depends on the time of day. Um, it's just a weird world that we live in. Anyway, my point was, Enough of all this. Let's not have any sacred places. It's a wall where people put little crumbles of paper. Can't, can't we just do that? But I don't think, personally, I don't think that's the future. I don't think we can strip the earth, cities, places, temples, sacred sites from the stories in which they're rooted. I don't think it works. I think some conversation about 
what makes a place sacred. And I think, how do we honor the sacredness of a particular place? Even if you don't find yourself to be a believer, how do people orient themselves around meaning is what I'm asking. Because that's a simple way of talking about a sacred place. It's a way of orienting your life or the community's life around meaning. So today's, today's little chat, talk, I want to talk about axis mundi. How many have heard that phrase before? Oh, now you have. I just said it. So you can, yes, the axis mundi. It's, again, Latin. Axis means like pivot, like a pivoting, like, like uh, the center of a wheel. And mundi is world. And every single religion that we know of had something like an axis mundi in, its, um, in the way it related to the earth itself, had a centerpiece, had a thing that, in which meaning would revolve like a wheel that helped the culture and the community orient itself. That's the axis Mundi. And they were actual places in the ancient world. Um, for, um, I made a giant list of them. Let me, let me look at them. Um, okay, here are some. First of all, we'll start with Mesopotamia. You've, you, have you ever seen the ziggurats? You know what a ziggurat is? It's like a pyramid in a way, but with stairs. And for um, the people groups that used ziggurats, and there, were more, there was more than one people group, it was a place in which heaven or the heavens and the earth touched. And they said, we were going to call this sacred. It probably was uh, maybe originally oriented. Uh, oriented around a certain experience, like maybe a leader or something, or some person had an experience of the divine or the sacred. They said it happened here, and then thus begins the building projects. And the ziggurat has that sort of, you know, upward pyramid-like connection up to the point. Probably the Tower of uh, Babel that's mentioned in, in Genesis, that myth, is probably referring to the ziggurats with stairs. By the way, the Mayans had a very similar thing, communicating a very similar idea. Here is where heaven and earth touch. The pyramids in Egypt also very similar concept. The axis mundi on which the earth rotated, and here they are. Heaven and earth are touching. The, the, by the way, the pyramids are very interesting because have you ever been in one? If not, you can just go watch them on National Geographic. You go in and you don't go up, you go down, which is very strange. Like if you saw them, you'd think what's inside that building, but that's not what's important. It's what's underneath. And so it has like upper world, middle world, and, and, and underworld all sort of in one axis mundi. The way in which here we're talking about empires. You have to have a lot of money to build a pyramid. But are orienting the, themselves around, around meaning. Have I made sense? Those are buildings that are sort of axis mundi places. Let's talk about stones. So here's a good one. In Jerusalem, we have a story that actually says it took place in the region of Moriah. And this is the binding of Isaac called the Akedah in Genesis. You're familiar with it? Abraham nearly sacrifices Isaac, but doesn't, changes his mind, and doesn't happen. That's supposed to have taken place in Jerusalem on a rock. And whether or not that, you know, historians love to come along and say, well, this, this, and this, and didn't happen here, and, but that doesn't even matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter what historical critical scholars have to say about the historicity of the event. What matters is the story. And suddenly, people begin to tell the story, it happened here, and begins this concentric circles of meaning. How do we orient ourselves toward meaning? To the story, in this case, of what it means to be a Jewish person. I orient myself around this rock. And on this rock, which was purchased by David in the Bible, Solomon, his son, builds a temple. Now we have a sense of permanence. Now we're permanently orienting ourselves around this particular place, only to be destroyed by the Babylonians, only to be, real, be rebuilt by Ezra and Nehemiah, the second temple, only to be destroyed by the Romans, only for the Romans to build a temple to Mars, the god of war, on top of the destroyed second temple, only to be destroyed, and later the Dome of the Rock, which is a Muslim shrine, to be built upon the same rock. Now, which is the right story? <laughs> 
it's definitely an axis mundi. Would you, would you agree? For a couple different faith traditions orienting themselves around. So it's very hard to say something like, well, don't worry about it anymore. You know, it's just a building. It's not just a building because the building is about story and the story is about time and, the, and, and time involves many generations of actual people around a kind of sacredness, a life that has meaning. So that's just to talk a bit about stones. What else did I come up with? Uh, you can also think about Axis Mundi as, as uh, physical um, places in the natural world, like mountains, like the Himalayas for Tibetan Buddhism. There's no building. It's a sacred place in and of itself in its own wildness. Or um, Mount Fuji. Um, or Harney Peak in the Black Hills, um, which is was from our reading today. It's just hinted at in our reading today. I'll come back to it in, in a little bit. But Harney Peak, a physical place and a sacred place. Or um, Ute Mountain in southwest Colorado, sacred for the Ute people. It's just a wild place. There's nothing on it. You're not even allowed to walk up onto it. There's no building. There's no, it's just a wild place in which there has been infused many generations of meaning and sort of hovering around the sacredness of a particular site. Um, Mount Zion, the Tetons. Let's talk about trees, because this is what we're getting to. Abraham planted a tree. You're everyone's favorite verse as a kid. Um, trees. Well, in, in, Greek, in uh, Greek culture, you have the cosmic tree. Maybe you've seen images of it. And I like the, the Greek notion of the cosmic tree particularly because the, it's, so, it's so obvious, the symbol. You have the upper part of the tree, the, the canopy of the tree, which is connected to transcendence, the divine, the gods, the upper world. You have the middle of the tree, the trunk, uh, which is the middle world and is the most useful part to people. They build homes out of them. They use it for fuel so forth. And then you have the kind of mysteries of the underworld down into the fissures of the rocks and stones and streams and soil. And the whole thing is the axis mundi, some sort of cosmic tree that we're all dwelling in is sort of the notion of um, axis mundi in that sense. And you have the Bodhi tree, which the Buddha sits under. My favorite image of Buddha, by the way, is him under the Bodhi tree, and he has one finger touching the ground and, and the other hand doing something else, which is precisely the axis mundi, earth, underworld, and upper world, and the tree itself, orienting around a kind of meaning. So that's a bit the axis mundi in Buddhism. You have the world ash tree in North, Norse mythology. Um, some of you are like, it's true. Um, you have the cross in Christianity. It's a tree. Don't forget that. It's just a tree. So to even say Jesus was put on a cross connects the image with a much more rich mythological symbol. And what is the central symbol to which Christians orient themselves around? Have you ever seen it around the neck? <laughs> it wasn't a gold thing that was pretty. It was a tree. That's what it was. It was a tree. So the symbol of orientation matters. What else? Um, I thought about the Christmas tree. By the way, that comes from the Celts. Mostly. There's a lot of debate because there's also a tree in Addis. Addis was from Asia Minor, uh, so pre-Greek religion. Um, but most likely it was the Celts who during the winter solstice decorated oak trees because they were barren and they were longing for the coming of the spring, so they put lights on them and other kinds of decorations. And then Christianity came along, and they're like, oh, this, this, this sounds pretty good. We'll sort of take that too. <laughs> and thus develops a bit of the tradition of decorating these trees during the winter solstice, longing for spring or Easter or the return of life, we might say. Not that you know anything about that. Um, okay, yeah, what else? Um, 
Okay, so that brings me back to Abraham, and I want to say a few things about Abraham. So Abraham plants a tamarisk tree, or an eshel, it's called in, in Hebrew, uh, in the Negev Desert here, in kind of a pretty barren place. And I just drove by Beersheba, and I thought it was funny because I saw the sign that said, to Beersheba, and I thought about this verse. And Abraham planted a tree in Beersheba and called upon the name of the Lord, and I could see in the distance an Ikea. Oh, that's just, just strange, you know? So I, actually, I want to I say something kind of direct about this, which is in, in biblical uh, Hebrew, there's not really, there is a word for faith, but it's not really what you think it is because lots of people think about faith as beliefs. It's just certain actions. That's all it is. Um, and, and this is preserved in Judaism. They, um, Jewish uh, people and the rabbis talked about faith as action, not beliefs, not ideas. And this is an act of faith. Abraham has certain strange and mysterious encounters with God that are recorded in Genesis, and his reaction to them is to plant a tree. Kind of a strange reaction, but in a very direct way, it's a sense of permanence. Okay, I trust you that I've had these experiences, and put it in cosmic terms, He's planting an axis mundi right here in the earth. And I'm orienting my world of meaning around this particular place. There it is. That's where it happened. That's where I had a moment with God. And that's where the story begins. And to plant a tree is to think about the future, not so much the here and now. In other words, he has a long view of time. After all, you tell me, what does God promise Abraham? Anyone know? No, not the land of milk and honey. That's Moses. The nation of Israel. It's not quite worded that way, but he promises him kids. And he doesn't have any kids, but he puts a tree in the ground thinking of his kids. All right? Which is actually, I mean, you can even take that. I'm not sure if there's really a lesson today. Like, I don't know if. My talks often have lessons, you have to tell me. But one is, what are you doing for the future? I mean, that is a very direct, I think, question that comes out of this small verse. However, this tree also is the garden, is uh, hints at the tree in the Garden of Eden. Knowledge, there are two trees, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and also the tree of life. It's a way of saying, all right, the garden has is being experienced in this place outside of Beersheba, the same sort of connection with the divine. Abraham has a taste of, and he puts a little tree of permanence there for future generations. Thus, beginning um, this sort of path of the sacred. What else do I want to say? I, also want to th I was also thinking about Moses, also another tree guy, wandering around in the wilderness, and he sees a tree that's on fire. What's, what's so special about a tree that's on fire in the desert? Probably not all that much, right? But the story is told, and if you go to Mount Sinai in, and to the monastery, they'll show you the tree. Do I really think it's the tree? I do not, personally. <laughs> I think that's very unlikely. But it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because the story around a certain place in the wilderness of the desert gets told, thus making the place sacred. I still want to ask the question, wind back to the beginning, which was, what is the sacredness of a place trying to teach? That's what I think I'm more interested in, in than the actual places. But what is the sacredness of a place trying to teach and I think there's something interesting going on with the burning bush, with this Abraham planting a tamarisk tree, with even the God of the Hebrews going around and living in a tent for a while, just going, kind of going nomadically place to place. And you start to begin to wonder, where does the divine or the sacred dwell? And it doesn't seem to be an easy question to answer. There seems to be, in other words, more than one sacred place. 
more than one axis mundi. There's not one place. There are multiple places out of which people begin to orient themselves and orient themselves around meaning. It's not fixed. A, a, a friend of mine, Peter Rollins, likes to say that the point of the burning bush story is that every tree is on fire. Now, you can't say that without a particular tree being on fire. Do you see how there's a relationship between the particular and the universal? So if I, and this is my main argument for the day, if this is an argument. I don't think we can bypass the particular. I think we have to have conversations about what makes a place sacred, what events happen in, in a certain place. Instead of just going around them saying, well, every tree is sacred. Well, if every tree is sacred, it feels like no tree is sacred. Do you, see, do you feel how the, there's some tension in there? By fixing it somewhere, it begins to open one up to the universal, which is precisely what Black Elk is saying in this reading today. So you should all read Black Elk Speaks. I highly recommend the book. It's very interesting. But he talks about having an experience of the spirit on Harney Peak. And instead of concluding Harney Peak is the only place where the spirit can be felt or experienced, listen to what Black Elk says. The first piece, which is the most important, is that which comes within the souls of people when they realize their relationship, their oneness with the universe and all its powers. And when they realize that at the center of the universe dwells Wonkin Tanka, the spirit, and that this center is really everywhere. In my mind, that's the aim or the direction of a conversation about sacred spaces. To experience it particularly somewhere opens one up to the experience of the universal. Even if you take this community gathering, we say, let's say every once in a while something sacred happens here. Here, in this physical space, with these kind of lame tiles, okay, and not the most friendly color scheme of rugs I've ever seen. In this place, I'm saying in this place, which is a real place, experienced in the here and now, what does that open us up to? The possibility of the universal, the axis mundi, being experienced everywhere. The particular and the universal are related. To be too hung up on the particular is to become a fundamentalist. Only God lives here, and I'm going to kill all of y'all if you don't believe me. But also, the, the other also is just not very compelling. Well, it's just, it's just everywhere. Well, where? <laughs> where? It's, it's this kind of universal, I think, tension that I don't think can ever be resolved. And I think a question about sacred space brings us into that tension. So what's my point? My point is to be on the hunt for sacred places and spaces, the particular, to have a nose for it, to honor it, to honor it wherever you see. I think one of the things I respect about this community is we have a variety of voices that come through here, and a variety of traditions and even faith traditions and no faith tradition. And some of the, our own curiosity is, tell us what it's like to be you. Tell us where and when you've experienced this axis mundi on which meaning is spinning. What's it like to be you? Particularly you. And maybe from that kind of contact, we can experience a bit more of the universal. I'll read you some from the Gospel of Thomas. I don't know why it's not in the Bible. Not that it's up to me, you know. The Gospel of Thomas was found in 1946. I've actually held it in my hand. Yeah, I went to Egypt, and I won't tell you the whole story, but it was behind a little glass case, but they handed it to me. I was like, oh, this is amazing. Here are some lines from the Gospel of Thomas that is very much like what I'm trying to say today. This is Jesus speaking. It's only a series of sayings, the Gospel of Thomas. There's no narrative. It's just saying, 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 saying. Here's one saying, split wood, I'm there. 
Lift up a rock and you will find me. This is Jesus, out of the mouth of Jesus, could actually be one of his authentic sayings, saying, you're looking for Christ in the wrong places. Or, if you only fixate Christ in one particular place, you miss Christ everywhere. Or the universal. Or meaning. Or whatever you fill in the blank. Or mystery. Split wood and I am there. Here's another one. If a leader says to you, the kingdom is in the heavens, then the birds of the air will be there before you. Here's another one. If the leaders say, look, the kingdom is in the seas, then the fish will be there before you. These are good. You have to admit these are good. Rather, the kingdom is within you and without. So just the moment you think, oh, he's saying the kingdom is within, he also adds and without. Well, what? I mean, this is probably much more what the historical Jesus was like, in my scholarly opinion. A lot of mysterious sayings and teachings. Split wood and I am there. That's the particular and the universal doing a kind of dance. So, what am I wanting to say here? What is the axis mundi, I guess, in a question that you've experienced? I really am curious about that. I mean, not right this second because we're running out of time. But in the talk back afterwards, the axis mundi that you've experienced. You've heard of the water walkers that walk around Lake Michigan? Why? Anyone know? Because they want to stay fit. No. Why? Why? Who knows? Because why? They're orienting the world of meaning around the water itself. It's their axis mundi. In other words, they say it's sacred. It's sacred. That's them. It's my mom. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no doubt. So the shoreline of Lake Michigan, the water itself, to the indigenous people is sacred. It's Axis Mundi. We have something to learn. And what do we have to learn? That particularly the water is sacred, which helps us wonder about what else is sacred. What else? How many other bodies of water? Only that one? So it's a kind of dance. The axis mundi is it's a kind of trick. It's saying in the old world, God is right here. Only to find out once you get there, wait a minute, where else? That's the, that's the gift. If you don't like the word God, the mystery of existence itself is particularly right here. And also, where else? Becomes the question. So I think maybe I'll just end with this. To me, being a spiritual person means opening up to the mystery of reality. That's what I would describe. That's my own spirituality. Opening up to the mystery of, the, of reality of the world around me, to the sacredness hidden in the split wood. There it is. If you ever chop wood, sometimes I think about that, the Gospel of Thomas. There it is. Some, some sacred mystery. And I think... Personally, my opinion is that we, we need a renewal of the sacred, not a minimizing of it. That's just, uh, I know other people would disagree with me. I think we need more of the sacred. And that's not to say we dismiss facts and science and technology. And, no, I, I'm saying it's a both, it's a both and. It's a sacredness and uh, I, I think also um, with our scientific minds. <laughs> And I think, I think that's all I want to say at this time. Let me end with how we started everybody's second favorite uh, book and verse, which is the book of Revelation. In the center of the garden is a tree. That's a reference to Eden right there. In the center of the garden is a tree. It's the very end of the book of Revelation. It's a myth. In the center is a tree. Its fruit is for the healing of the nations. The particular helps expand to the universal. 
And to taste that brings healing among what is ordinarily divisive. Meaning, I say this is the way it is. I say this is the way it is. This person envisions a kind of healing tree that we eat upon that brings people into a greater sense of union and connection. That's all I got for you today. Thanks.